it's just a pleasure to be here to be able to address you at this very important conference. Uh, I heard you had some wonderful sessions this morning. I know it will continue on this afternoon. And on a topic that is uh, so important and continues to be important, uh, I'm humbled by being here today because I am joined by some of my colleagues that I worked with uh, many, many years ago. Of course, Monique Fries, uh, who needs no introduction, a pioneer in women in science and engineering, Claire Deschenes, and so many others that have, uh, and Ruby, so many others who have been instrumental at making change in this country, supporting women, uh, being leaders and advocates, pushing the envelope, having the difficult conversations. And I know today you're building on that. And uh, I know when we work together as chairs for women in science and engineering, building on the great work that uh, Monique had done as the national chair, this was back in 97 to 2002 for me as I held the uh, prairie chair for si women in science and engineering, I'm not sure we'd be thinking that we'd be sitting here in 2017 having these conversations. And you see what uh, has uh, hap been happening in Silicon Valley about the women in tech. Um, much has changed. Much has changed because of the work that you have done, many men have done, um, how society has evolved, but it is so important to continue the conversation. I know even when I was a dean of engineering, uh, some people said, well, you know, women in engineering, that's done. Let's move on to the next thing. Well, there's lots of other important issues we need to be talking about, but let's not lose sight of women in STEM. It is so critical, and I can tell you as a female president, um, you know, one of the conversations we were engaged with actually yesterday, and I'm not sure, is my colleague Susan Scone here from the university? Yes, yeah, Susan is uh, one of our associate vice presidents research, my former PhD student as well at the University of Calgary, and she's leading the charge on our campus for gender diversity and particularly with the Canada Research Chairs program of ensuring that we have a better balance of attracting women into these uh, very significant, impactful research chairs uh, that are absolutely critical to drive Canada forward in uh, innovation. So it's wonderful uh, to be here today and to share some of my lessons learned around leadership. And part of that is to really perhaps position a little bit of where I am now in leadership, uh, but also uh, a little bit about my own leadership journey. As was mentioned, I'm the president and vice chancellor of the University of Calgary. I'm in my eighth year. Uh, it has gone so fast. It's been a fascinating journey. Uh, but it's not my first leadership experience. In fact, people say, when did you get interested in leadership? Well, it was effectively in 1996, 1997. I always say my first leadership opportunity was being a chair for women in science and engineering. Why? Because uh, it took me out of sort of the teaching and research, which I was doing and I loved, and I was able to tackle again, with my colleagues and lots of support, a really important issue, a very complex issue. It was a blank page in terms of what we could do. I had some financial support, some resources to invest, but a big problem to be able to address and try to make change. Well, that's when leadership comes in because it's all about being strategic, being disciplined, uh, being careful around managing expectations of yourself and others around you. And that really gave me a taste of how, as women, we can have a voice. We can institute change. We can have influence on others. We can work with wonderful colleagues. And we can learn, and then we can grow. So that was certainly where I started. Where I sit today as a president of the University of Calgary, uh, there are actually 96 universities in Canada. About 20% of those institutions have a female leader. Uh, if you look at a subset of those universities, what we call the U15, that's the 15 most research intensive universities, um, of those 15, there are three of us who are actually female. There was a maximum at one point of four, went down to two, now we're at three. 
Um, so there aren't a lot of us, and particularly if I go back to the 20% of, of the 96, that number has not shifted in 20 years. So we've seen women come and go, but we've not seen a, a huge change in the representation, at least in my sector, of women at the very top of the game. One thing I'm particularly proud of on our campus and this wasn't particularly by design, uh, but when I came into my role in 2010, part of what you do as a president is you um, either keep your team, you change out some people, you rebuild, depending on uh, sort of the relationships you have and what you see you need to do for the future. Well, I did make some change. In fact, all of the people on my team um, joined over the last uh, seven years, but of our eight-member executive leadership team, six are women, 75%, including our provost, Drew Marshall, uh, who also is a female leader, and I think that's unique amongst the U15. So I'm very proud of this because uh, these are very accomplished women. In fact, when I went to hire my last VP, the conversation was, well, do we need more men on the team? Because the gender balance is almost going a little bit uh, the other way, but we, we we do well and uh, we, we, do, we do, do tease the guys a little bit, I have to admit. So that's part of the uh, context that I work in. Um, but what I did want to do is really move to uh, what I have learned over my journey. And I have to say, because I'm in a room of, of engineers, that having an engineering formation I think has been incredibly helpful to me as a leader because when you're in leadership it is about identification of problems, uh, identifying solutions because you can't just stay in the problem world, you've got to move to the solution environment, uh, being logical, being rational, um, making sure that you're organized and deliberate. All of the things that we do as engineers are absolutely critical components to strong leadership. One of the challenges, and I'll talk about this, is not everybody we work with is like that. And that was one of my learnings, actually. Like, well, in engineering, we'd do it this way. And why are you doing it that way? And that's when we get into the human behavior side, because you can have all the wonderful ideas and all the best made plans and strategies, but it's the human dimension that makes the world complex, just look around us today, and makes jobs as leaders very complex as well. So uh, although when I became president, people were very nervous that an engineer was going to be running the university, what was she going to do to us? I have also always said I'm an engineer with strong EQ, so hopefully that has served me well. So, as a university president, I actually have very little power. People say, Elizabeth Cannon, she runs the University of Calgary. I said, I don't run anything. Uh, universities, by definition, have a very um, diffuse uh, structure of, uh, of leadership of decision-making, of course, we value collegiality and academic freedom. We have committees for everything. So the role of president, in fact, is quite unique because it is about inspiration and leadership. And as somebody said to me, being a university president is like being in a cemetery. Lots of bodies under you, but nobody is listening. So. <laughs> So what have I learned over this time? I want to touch on some of the things that I have really built on through my own background. And I think as you evolve through your life and your career, sometimes you don't realize some of those foundational aspects of your personality, of your leadership style, come from your family or your environment. So I want to speak a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit more about my role as, as president, and then, as was noted, my top five lessons that I have learned and try to practice throughout my career. To take a step back, I was born and raised in Prince Edward Island, so on the other side of this great country, where both my mother and father's families uh, had settled in the 1800s. Islanders are known for their friendliness, work ethic, and sense of fun. I hope I have adopted a little bit of each of those. And they say, once an Islander, always an Islander. 
I think it's my island roots that I have really uh, held dear as something to really uh, keep me humble and keep me grounded. I have been blessed to come from a family of strong women. My grandmother, Sarah Elizabeth McLeod, was just a teenager at the turn of the last century, but she was determined to take her grade 10 business stenographer course, which was a very big deal at that time, and she used her education to build a career that she loved. Her daughter, my mother, grew up knowing that education was going to be very important in her future as well. She says that she remembers deciding in grade three that she would go to university. And sure enough, as a young woman, she left Prince Edward Island and went to McGill to their agriculture school to get a science degree. Most women at McGill in the 40s were studying home economics. My mother was one of about six women amongst the 800 students in the agricultural school. And when she graduated in 1949, she went home to PEI to work at Agriculture Canada. And after having children, she studied for an education degree to become a high school math and science teacher. Again, a very unique position for women at that time. So I learned from my grandmother and mother, or perhaps a better word is I absorbed, was a tendency to ignore barriers. I grew up being happily oblivious to the limitations most girls took for granted. I saw the women in my family go after their goals, live their lives in ways that were meaningful to them without the thought as to whether others would approve. This grounding served me well as a foundation for my own career in studying engineering and pursuing a career in industry and academia. But like many here today, my career took twists and turns. I did not envision myself to be a university professor, let alone a university president. But I've been in my role for just over seven years. After I had a chair for women in science and engineering, a wonderful learning experience, I went to the dark side at the university and became a department head, and then dean of engineering, and then of course president in 2010. This is my greatest leadership challenge. It is both humbling and invigorating. It's a privilege to be a president of a university. And especially, I feel, and of course I'm a bit biased, the University of Calgary. We're a large organization, over 32,000 students, 6,000 faculty and staff. Our budget is $1.3 billion per year. We have an economic impact in the Calgary region of over $8 billion a year. So we're one of the largest employers in our city, a significant, it's almost like it's, it, we would be about the fifth or sixth largest town in Alberta if, if we carved out the size of the university. We have a goal, like other universities, to create an environment where our students can receive a top quality education, our researchers can contribute to our economy and society, and that we value discovery, creativity, and innovation. Part of that, and it was mentioned, that we have on our campus the Eyes High strategy. As an engineer, I am very well versed in that if you don't know where you're going, you're certainly not going to get there. And one of the things that I have learned throughout my career is that my role as a leader is to help shape, and I say help because we work, of course, with our community into a future direction that we all agree to, align to, and work our way towards. And uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, a few of the statistics that we've been able to achieve as a university, and I've been very proud. This has certainly been a team effort across our organization and our community. So what does a president do? To quote a presidential colleague, we work on reputation, relationships, and resources. Our reputation is all about our brand, and promoting the accomplishments of our faculty and our students and our alumni. That is our currency, the reputation of our institution. 
Our relationships, there are so many, whether it's government, industry, students, faculty, staff, alumni, community leaders and donors near and far. Very often, our stakeholders aren't all in agreement about what we should do or how we did something. And to manage that very complex web of relationships can be quite difficult. The third is resources. We rely mostly on government for support, federal and provincial, to support both our core operations and also our research. We also are involved in fundraising significantly. We currently have a $1.3 billion campaign to support student scholarships, research, infrastructure, and chairs. So this keeps you very busy, and it doesn't sound a lot like engineering. But I can tell you, everything that I learned as an engineer, to be able to create structure, to be able to bring people together, and to be able to drive solutions and innovation, that is helpful in all of those dimensions around reputation, relationships, and resources. But I did want to boil down my learnings into five areas that I feel are critically important, certainly to my journey, and I think to many others as well. So I'm going to walk through them. The first is, as a leader, you set the ethical and integrity high bar in your organization. Recent surveys have shown that the public mistrust of government is at its highest levels ever. I would anecdotally extend this finding to many public and private sector organizations as well. The values that you as a leader project through your actions not just words, but actions, will resonate consciously and subconsciously with your employees and stakeholders. Set high expectations of yourself and those around you. This is the so-called tone at the top. People are watching you. What did you say? What did you do? How did you act? You do what is best for your organization, not yourself. You could ask, this seems like common sense. Aren't most people motivated to do the right thing and act with integrity? Actually, the simple answer is no. This, I will say, was a very hard lesson for me. Coming, I'd say, particularly from an engineering profession that values ethics. Um, we see our role as protection of the public as professional engineers. Um, I have seen behaviors of others that I question, that they have justified to themselves, that I need to uh, understand and of course uh, try to deal with depending on what the particular circumstance is. There was uh, some research actually at the University of Calgary which I found quite fascinating to help me better understand you know, what I was seeing. Uh, it was a book actually by one of our faculty members, Kibom Lee, from our institution, co-authored uh, with Michael Ashton from Brock University. And the, and the book is called The H Factor of Personality. The subtitle says, why some people are manipulative, self-entitled, materialistic, and exploitive, and why it matters to everyone. I mean, a bit of a shocking title. But really, the research, uh, this so-called H factor, is the sixth factor beyond the traditional five personality factors, which are defined as emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness, consciousness, and openness to experience. And with the personality dimension that they're calling honesty and humility, that's the H factor. People with higher levels of H are sincere and assuming, and people with lower levels are deceitful and conceited. Some people with low levels of H factor can end up in positions of power and trust in an organization. You have to watch for these people. They do exist. And part of what the book talks about is how you can assess someone's age level, how you can uh, deal with them and ensure that it does not have or minimize the impact on you and the organization. You will be tested. You will uh, have to be courageous as a leader to face challenges and make decisions. They say it's lonely at the top 
In fact, they say it's lonely at the top, but you eat better. That is true. And I find particularly having strong values, strong principles when you make decisions allow you to set that integrity and ethical high bar. Number two, know your political capital and when to use it or not. What is political capital? All of the components that allow a leader to get a job done, such as your reputation, credibility, popularity, and network. When you start a new role, you are given the so-called honeymoon period. Remember this, Elizabeth, when you go to Australia. You're given the benefit of the doubt. You can use it to make some tough decisions or key changes in your organization. But when you do this, you spend some of your political or social capital, meaning you need to continually earn and replace that political capital over time. It's like a piggy bank. You have limited time and capacity, which ultimately need to be used to progress your organization. That is a challenge, certainly, that I face. And this was a discussion the last two days. We were at an executive leadership retreat of our team. We are very uh, results-oriented, no surprising having an engineer at the helm. Um, and one of the things we talk about is pace. You can't do it all in a year or two. How do you manage that? And particularly as leaders, we are used to change. We are used to making decisions, seeing results. Most of the people in our organizations are not of that ilk. They need to be brought along. They need to feel comfortable. You need to communicate. They need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. So using that political capital in a way that is going to progress the institution, spending it well, and not squandering it is absolutely important. And when I say not squandering it, what I really mean, and you've all heard this before, is knowing which hills to die on. You can't die on all of them. And I think sometimes, and I have to have my own checks and balances, as women, we are very invested, we're very passionate, we want to look out for you know, everyone and everything, but you can't take on all the issues. You can't have all the fights on everything. You've got to pace yourself. So the key is to know how much political capital you have at any point in time, and with whom, because of course that can uh, change depending on the environment you're in. That means being self-aware and aware of others. How are you perceived? The so-called emotional intelligence. Research tracking of over 160 high-performing individuals in a variety of industries and job levels revealed that emotional intelligence was two times more important in contributing to excellence than intellect and expertise alone. You are in your organizations, and certainly I am surrounded with really smart people, really bright people. But having the emotional intelligence to be self-aware, how you're being perceived, how you're coming across, when to pull back, when to push forward, absolutely imperative. Number three, build and nurture a high performance team. I am a big believer in a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. And in there he talks about leaders needing to get the right people on the bus. Because it doesn't matter how much energy you have, how much vision you have, you cannot do the job alone. You will be judged by the company you keep. Part of this implies that you need to know yourself and invest time and energy in finding out your style of work. Do you like more or less structure? What motivates you? What are your triggers for conflict? How do you deal with conflict? What is your sense of urgency around issues? How do you build relationships quickly, slowly, and so on and so forth? Be yourself and find out what works for you because not everyone like you will be in your environment. In fact, you don't want to surround yourself with everyone like you. 
So you need to build the team, and then you need to nurture the team. Certainly, uh, on my executive leadership team, I, I had the ability to bring everyone onto my team. Uh, I can tell you, you go through all the normal interviews, you know, this is what I'm looking for, this is their experience. And uh, what I also instituted in that process is uh, effectively a, um, an assessment of people's management styles. Because again, they may be very bright, they may be very skilled, but they may not be a good fit for you and the team. Not meaning they have to be like you, but you need to understand what your triggers are and that they're going to be effective amongst the team. So we had everybody uh, go through that process so I could understand um, what they would be like, how well suited they are to the environment, and to set them up for success. But once you have them on the team, you have to nurture the team, as I mentioned. You can make the assumption, well, the higher you go in an organization, and you know, people have titles of vice presidents or deans or what have you, they're really smart, you know, they're accomplished, they know what they're doing. You put them in a room and you figure out where you want to go and off you do it and everything's good. No, it doesn't work that way. And especially, and I would consider our team a high performing team, you can't just expect it's all going to fall into place. I put a significant amount of my time into team building and team development. That's what part of the last two days at our offsite retreat was all about. Because I have learned that all of the behaviors that you saw on the playground when you were four or five years old, that plays out through everybody's life and career. People have different motivations. They're anxious. They may have an agenda. They're ambitious. They're perhaps a little bit insecure. Um, all of those things play out within the workplace. And your job as the leader is to have a high-functioning, coherent team. So our team, we have regular sessions with facilitators, coaches, if you will. And we talk about, we do all kinds of surveys to, again, figure out ourselves, share it with one another. Um, you know, what we, we went through one, what is our motivational value system? You can be motivated by results, people, or process, or a combination of those. Where does everybody stack up? What are your triggers for conflict? What are your behaviors in conflict? And having each other understand what that looks like, because we're all going to be different, is really important because then we can help facilitate and manage conflict. Because having conflict is not a bad thing. You can progress an organization and a strategy, but how do you manage it that it's done in a way that's going to get to a better place but not be destructive? So having your team performing well is not something you can take for granted. Um, and I can tell you, and, and some of you I know are at universities or companies, if you perceive the senior executive team is not a team, they're not operating as a coherent unit, that is unsettling through the whole organization. People can see it, they can feel it. It's, it's, it's not healthy for your, uh, for not only for the team, but for your organization overall. Um, I would also, uh, as part of that, and we talk a lot about this, uh, again, we have great strategies and great plans. The culture of the organization is as important as the strategy. And I always uh, quote, it's one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have the best laid plans, but if you are not building a culture in your organization to enable the strategy, you will not be successful. And one of the first things, certainly when I came in as president in 2010, is we did an employee engagement survey. We hired a third party firm. We went, and this is pretty standard in industry, not so much in academia. Went out to our faculty and staff and asked about 80 questions. And it was really to get a, a, a sense of the culture of the University of Calgary at that time. And I can tell you, I knew it was going to be terrible, but I wanted to set a baseline. I wanted to get the results in employee engagement and enablement, so then my job was to drive to make it better. And the only way as an engineer you're going to make it better is to have some data, qualitative and quantitative, to understand the situation. 
So every two years, we go back and measure. We hold our deans and leaders accountable to action plans. We have data by unit and faculty. We share all everybody's data across the institution. We have now exceeded public and private sector norms. It is something people take very seriously because that is what's going to drive our eyes high strategy. So culture eats strategy for breakfast, have a strong team and nurture. Number four, be patient and celebrate successes. Um, if you uh, are working hard and you're achieving lots, sometimes, and I find this myself, one of the toughest things to do is patience, is taking uh, on their roles, you're driving change, you're making a difference, and what becomes sometimes uh, a result of that is that you don't take time to step back, that to really celebrate what's working well, um, how we're doing as an organization, give yourself the pat in the back and not always sort of charging ahead. And what can happen is you can almost become frenetic and chaotic. I mean, even people have said in my seven years as president, I'm much more relaxed now than I was in year one or two. Well, that's because I've got experience. You have a sense that things are on track and you can feel pretty good. I remember one case, and this has told me that perhaps things were a little bit too chaotic. I uh, was coming home from a business trip. I uh, got off the plane, got my luggage, I get into the taxi, taxi took me home. My lovely husband, who every time I come home at night, he comes to the front door, he opens the door and welcomes me home. So he does that when I'm coming home from this business trip and he says, well, where's your car? And I said, oh, the car's at the airport. Because I just literally got into the taxi and off I went. So I said, okay, maybe things are a little bit too hectic. So how uh, do we do this? One thing that I have learned is, and I think particularly as women leaders, we put a lot of pressure on your, ourselves. I certainly do. Maybe the environment does uh, uh, as well. Is really about being clear on managing expectations. Managing expectations I have of myself and what others have of me or how I perceive uh, people have expectations on me. That's why I continuously strive for clarity. Clarity in strategies, clarity in plans, clarity in outcomes. When I came into my role in 2010, there was no uh, sort of clear performance planning process. It was kind of all over the place. We now have very tight processes on what I'm doing, what our team's doing, how it maps to the strategy, how we communicate, how we report it out, how we explain it to our key stakeholders, and so on. That is important because if somebody asks me, why are you doing this and not that, or why is the institution going in this direction and not that direction, I can be very, very clear. And people can understand it, and that's a big part of my job. And in fact, when we did that employee engagement survey I talked about, one of the questions is, to all our faculty and staff, do you understand the eyes high strategy? Now, for those at a university, you would all have an institutional strategy. Do you understand it? Do you think you understand it? Do you use it? Uh, that varies. That, of all the 80 questions we asked, the question that had the highest response rate was that one. 82% of our faculty and staff say they understand the institutional strategy. That, to me, tells that people are getting what we're trying to do. I have to tell you, number two, which I was very proud of, is that, to, again, uh, just under 82% said that they uh, work in a harassment-free environment, which was great, and number three is they're proud of the institution. So managing expectations, um, ensuring that there is clarity, constantly communicating, constantly communicating what you're doing and why you're doing it, not getting pulled down into the daily setbacks. You can get um, frazzled five times a day if you let it, focusing on the long-term goals, delegating to your team, and being positive and constructive, filtering out the noise, as we say. A friend of mine who is a leader said a big job of a leader is simplifying complexity. Universities, organizations, societies are extremely complex. Your role as a leader is to simplify down into a, an image, a narrative that is clear and understandable so people can rally behind. 
Number five, number five in my lessons learned is be prepared in times of crises because with all of your intent as a great leader, of all of the work you do in building your culture and your strategy, I can tell you bad things will happen. They could come, it could be an accident or an incident, it could be something that happens on your campus to your students, to you as a leader, uh, university presidents are under the uh, spotlight like never before. The average term of a university president in Canada is less than five years right now. So uh, you've seen a lot of turnover in these roles and particularly for women presidents, I must say, which is uh, quite unsettling. So being prepared, and I can tell you, uh, I've had uh, my own crises at our institution knowing that the institution is um, really uh, put its effort in to deal with crisis. People know what they need to do and why they need to do it. Having a, uh, learning how to deal with a crisis in a crisis is not a recipe for success. And I would say in my own particular case, um, I had a, a situation a few years ago that was very, very difficult personally and also difficult for the institution um, having support systems around me to deal with that was absolutely key. But I can tell you, and I want to end on, on a, a light note, and I want to bring it back to engineering, is I have used my engineering skills to get me out of a so-called crisis. So I'll just leave you with this last story. I was going to, uh, this is about two or three years into my presidency, and I was going to a press conference over in our medical school, and I was literally walking, ready to walk into the green room to get us all prepared of what we were going to do. And I, you know, if you know me, I do tend to wear high-heeled shoes quite often. I had my high-heeled shoes on. I'm walking in, and my heel breaks. So I'm kind of doing this. It's, you know, not very good. I was going to be on TV, and I was with politicians, and I was, you know, really quite unsettled. Well, the first thing you do is, like, who's got eight and a half size shoes? And nobody did. So then I'm, you know, the old engineering brain is kicking in. So I said, does anybody have duct tape? <laughs> So that was the engineering solution. We got the black duct tape, we taped up the heel, and off we went, and nobody knew the difference. Thank you very much.